Good morning ladies and gentlemen, my name is Colin Howells and I welcome you back to this series of studies uh, in the book of Revelation. So welcome to Colin's Corner. I'm sorry it's been a long time since I was last with you. Uh, I've been away and I've also been very busy preparing uh, sermons for different uh, places where I shall be preaching uh, in the uh, coming days. But before, so without further ado, and if I could just invite you to click the thumbs up sign uh, at the bottom and also the subscribe to this channel so that you can keep in touch with uh, our progress through this last book of the Bible. So without further ado, let's start the study. Revelation 4 and 5 describe the Apostle John being caught away by the Holy Spirit and being given an amazing vision of God's throne in heaven. We perhaps need to remind ourselves that he found himself on the barren island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea, having been exiled there because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was the companion in suffering of those believers undergoing persecution towards the end of the first century, and the situation was bad. He was the last living apostle, and five of the seven churches to which Jesus sent his letters were struggling. John was deeply aware of the pressures that they were under. He had been commissioned by God to write and encourage these persecuted believers. And so it is that we find him transported in the Spirit to witness what was taking place behind the scenes. In our last study we saw how he tells us of the amazing glory of the one seated upon the throne, encircled by a rainbow. From this throne emanates thunder and lightning, and around it twenty-four elders, which I interpreted last time as being God's redeemed people representing both Old and New Testament. They're together with four living creatures, symbolic of the whole of creation, and they all worship the one who is seated on the throne. Chapter 5 takes our attention to uh, heaven itself. We move from the God of creation to the God of redemption. No longer is our focus on the glory of the one seated on the throne, surrounded by his courtiers, but to the Lamb, who alone is worthy to open the scroll. Before studying that chapter in detail, perhaps one or two uh, preliminary comments are necessary. First of all, the sealed scroll. Here, as John has done before, he combines elements from the Old Testament to those with which his readers would have been familiar. Common practice at the end of the first century which they would recognise. They would have known, of course, about the prophet Ezekiel receiving a scroll with words of lament written on both sides. You find that in Ezekiel chapter 2. And no doubt they would have remembered also the passage in Daniel chapter 12, where the prophet received instructions to seal up the words of the scroll containing the names of God's people until the time of the end. They would have known of the enormous scroll mentioned in the book of Zechariah concerning the vanishing of every thief and liar. Opinions vary as to the exact contents of this scroll here, but I believe that Vernon Pothres is correct when he identifies it as being a heavenly book containing God's plan and destiny of the world. Back in Daniel's day, the prophet was told by the man clothed in linen to roll and seal the scroll until the time of the end, and perplexed, Daniel had asked him to explain the meaning of these things. My Lord, what will be the outcome of all this? And the 
man with the linen clothes said, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. So those who are wise and understand are those to whom God has given or Jesus has given ears to hear. And having been given these ears to hear, it was time for the scroll to be opened and its contents revealed. Daniel's prophecy was to remain sealed until the time of the end because the Old Testament believers couldn't possibly have understood how God would bring about the blessings of the Messianic age without the knowledge of the person and work of the Lord Jesus. Jesus' own disciples had trouble in understanding uh, until the death and resurrection. We remember those two disciples on the road to Emmaus who had uh, based all their hopes on Jesus who they thought would deliver them from Rome. But on the way back from Jerusalem, downcast, uh, Jesus caught up with them and explained the scriptures to them. And they, at last they realized that he was alive again and they went back to Jerusalem full of joy. A will had to be, uh, well, before that, um, it was now time, of course, for the scroll to be opened. John's readers would have been aware of the fact that according to common practice at the end of the first century, uh, official documents and last wills and testaments were sealed with the author's personal seal, ensuring the authenticity and authority of the contents. And those wills had to be witnessed by seven witnesses. In this case here, the sevenfold spirit of God standing before the throne. Some people have questioned the absence of anyone worthy in heaven, for they rightly say that according to chapter 22, verse 27, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful and deceitful. But the word itself, worthy, means to be qualified, it, to someone who has the proper credentials. And none of the Old Testament patriarchs, prophets or kings present in glory were worthy in that sense. They didn't have the proper credentials. None of the living creatures, none of the 24 elders, no other religious leader, none of the myriads of angels around the throne, not even the mighty angel who cried out with a mighty voice was worthy. John tells us that literally no one else in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look inside, since it contained information about the unfolding chapters of redemptive history. It could only be opened by a human being who himself had been slain. Because of human sin, no one was worthy, only somebody who was both God and man, someone who had perfectly fulfilled God's requirements would be worthy. And so comes this booming question, or following the booming question, comes silence. It appears that the invitation was given with a trumpet-like voice. Chapter 4, verse 1, come up here and I will show you what must take place after it. But it seems that it was about to be thwarted unless the seals are broken. Unless the scroll is opened, then God's plan will remain a mystery. God's people don't have access to the contents. And so it's not surprising that John was disappointed. And that disappointment was manifested by floods of tears. So the call comes to him, do not weep, stop crying, John. Again. Some may object that in chapter 21, verse 4, we read, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order has passed away. 
And that, of course, is true. But John was describing his vision in human terms. Physically, he was still on the Isle of Patmos. The elder tells him not to weep, for there is one who is worthy to open the scroll, to unlock those seals. The scroll will not remain unopened. God's will and purpose will be revealed and carried out. Behold, look, he says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And so we come to these Old Testament messianic references. First of all, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Both these terms come from the tradition of Jewish messianism. The first from Genesis, when Jacob blessed his two sons, Genesis chapter 49. He compared Judah to a lion insisting on the two principal characteristics of a lion, its strength when it devours its prey and its royal authority. It's not for nothing that we call the lion the king of the jungle. But the second term, the root of David, comes from Isaiah chapter 11, where we read a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From its roots a branch will bear fruit, in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him. His resting place will be glorious. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem one week before his crucifixion, the crowd acclaimed him as being the son of David, asking God to bless his coming kingdom. So, having told John that this is the one who is worthy, but before John looked and saw it's important to notice what the elder says next. He tells John that this lion of Judah, this root of David, has already triumphed. His victory isn't something which lies in the future when he returns in glory. Because of the cross, because of the empty tomb, the victory is already accomplished. Satan has been defeated. With the opening of the scroll, the time has now come for his glorious judgments to be executed, the nature of which will become apparent in the following chapters. It's with that certainty that I propose to look at the rest of the chapter. First of all, the slain lamb. Then I saw a lamb looking as it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated upon the throne. John turned round to see a lion, and he saw a lamb. And in placing the exhortation of the elder do not weep see the lion of the tribe of judah has triumphed side by side with what john actually sees it is clear that he sees or the two are one and the same what a juxtaposition a powerful conquering lion and a slaughtered lamb a paradox on the one hand he's told that the lion has triumphed that the victory has been accomplished but it's accomplished by a slain lamb. God shows his strength in apparent weakness. Why has the lamb been killed? Once again, we turn to the Old Testament for the answer. If we go back to Exodus chapter 12, verses 3, 5 and 6, 12 and 13, we discover that each year the Israelites were to kill a lamb as a memorial to their delivery from the slavery in Egypt. At that time, God accomplished a great victory over Pharaoh, thanks to the blood of the paschal lamb applied to the doorposts and the lintel of the Hebrew houses. God spared his people from judgment, the judgment that fell on the Egyptians. He accepted that expiatory death of a lamb in the place of the firstborn, 
And following on from that, God set in place a whole system of sacrifices as a forerunner, as a, a, a sign, if you wish, a symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the context of Revelation, the Lamb had been slain because he had been the faithful witness par excellence. Later in chapter 10, John will see another bittersweet scroll which has to do with two witnesses who will also be killed. How will the dragon, the beast, the false prophet be defeated? How will God put an end to their tyranny? How will justice prevail and the death of the martyrs be avenged? The answer is astonishing. Not by acting like a lion, but by being slain like a lamb. We must never forget that there is a throne in heaven but there is a lamb on that throne. John's description of that lamb shows that it's no ordinary lamb. Any attempt to visualise the seven-horned, seven-eyed lamb literally should remind us of the symbolic nature of John's visions. I've already said that John already often borrows his pictures from the Old Testament. Here, he seems to audaciously borrow one from Jewish apocalyptic imagery. Instead of an, the image presented by Isaiah of a lamb being led to the slaughter, here it's depicted in the Maccabean tradition as arising from the flock of God's people and delivering them from their enemies. The image of horns suggests the idea of conquest. The seven symbolizing perfection. So here we have a symbol of the fullness of Jesus' triumph over death and the grave. The reference to seven eyes, which are the sp seven spirits of God, comes from Zechariah, where they're the Old Testament picture of the Holy Spirit. And whereas in Old Testament times his action was limited, now in the Messianic age, after the conquest of the Lamb, the Holy Spirit goes forth into all the world. And then there's a significant pause. John sees the Lamb approach God, take the scroll in his right hand, just as Daniel described in Daniel chapter 7. He it is who is worthy, and we might expect that immediately he would start to open the seal. Everyone is waiting with bated breath to see what will happen. But no, before the seals are open, and it will be the same with the trumpets and the bowls of wrath, there is a delay. It's those waiting periods which are vital in our understanding of what is to take place. These intervals link what is happening on the earth with what is taking place in heaven. And we will discover that the judgments on earth are directly linked to what is taking place in heaven. This, the terrible judgments which strike the earth come from the throne room of God. There, there are people who are praying. When the Lamb had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So the taking of the scroll from the hand of the one seated on the throne leads to this greatest scene of universal worship which has ever been recorded. For one thing, it shows us that the Lamb possesses the same glory and authority as the one seated on the throne. And when the heavenly multitude worships the Lamb, it worships him as the second person of the Trinity. <clears throat> his majesty and glory are equal to the one of the to that of the one seated on the throne. No mere creature could ever possess such glory. And we can't help but notice that the four living creatures and the 24 elders bow down before the Lamb and worship him, and they present the prayers of God's people 
in golden bowls full of incense. Later on, in chapter 6 and chapter 8, these prayers are described as being calls for divine vindication of the martyred believers. Both are directly linked to the judgment of the ungodly. It thus follows that the prayers mentioned here are not just praises, but also requests that God defend the honour and reputation of his people by judging the persecutors of them. When we pray for God's persecuted people throughout the world at this present troubled time, God hears, he takes note, and one day the death of these beloved brothers and sisters of ours will be vindicated. And then we come to a new song. These people there around the throne sing a new song, saying you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain. With your blood you've purchased for God persons from every tribe and language, people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests, to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. The interval between the vision of the sealed scroll and the breaking of the first seal is filled with the worship of the Lamb. The multitude gathered around the throne don't get out their calculators and timelines trying to work out when all these things or this aspect or that aspect will take place. No, they bow down and worship and they sing. In chapter 4, two songs were sung in honour of the one who is on the throne. Here in chapter 5, we discover another two songs, worship songs, singing praises to the Lamb, and then one addressed to both, the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, with harps in their hands and bowls of incense, reminiscent of the Levitical priests in the Old Testament, commissioned to leave the, lead the people in praise and worship of Almighty God. And throughout the Old Testament, the songs have been expressions of praise to the one who granted victory to his people over their enemies. Here, these creatures and the elders sing a new song. They're commemorating the Lamb who was slain and who had gained victory over sin and death, inaugurating a new creation. He is the king of an everlasting kingdom extending to the ends of the earth, encompassing the elect from every nation. The opening stanza of the song recognises his worthiness to take the scroll and open it. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. The cherubim and the, and the elders fall down before the Lamb and sing this new song, proclaiming him to be worthy. God is going to work everything out, everything that must come to pass. And because he is in charge, everything that is supposed to come to pass will come to pass. He is worthy, not because of his power and authority, but because he has been slain, and with his blood he has purchased for God people from every country, every ethnicity, in the world. Revelation shows us that the world contains a people who have been ransomed, a people composed of representatives of every tribe, of every language, people and nation. It's an expression that occurs seven times in this book. Ethnic diversity is at the heart of God's saving purposes in Christ. White Christians do not form one kingdom of priests, whereas black Christians form another. There is but one kingdom of priests, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of physiological or any other differences. And when we permit racial, ethnic or sexual prejudice to dominate our thinking and behaviour, then we are blaspheming, we're going against the majesty of our Creator, despising the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus, slandering the work of the Holy Spirit, 
who is shaping men and women of all races, of all colours, all creeds in his image. We cannot worship and glorify the majesty of God and embrace his redemptive purposes in Christ while treating his supreme creation with contempt, whatever the colour, culture, sex or age that may be. He is worthy to receive glory and praise and worship. The song sung by the four living creatures leads to an avalanche, a snowball effect, an avalanche of praise. John sees myriads who add their voices to the celestial choir. First it was the cherubim and the elders. They were joined by the myriads of angels, intensifying the worship by adding that he is worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour, glory and blessing. This sevenfold acclamation shows that nothing is being withheld. If God is worthy to receive all of this, it is because he is the creator of all things. If the Lamb is worthy to receive this, it's because he is the Redeemer. And if that wasn't enough, verse 13 tells us that every creature on, in heaven and on earth, under the earth and in the sea, all that is in them, begin to praise the ridden Lamb. The composer George Frederick Handel used verse 12 as the summit of his oratorio, The Messiah. The Amen chorus which follows starts with the basses, then the tenors, then the altos, and finally the sopranos, until the whole choir is singing Amen. And to the cry, or to this cry, worthy is the Lamb. What a wonderful climax to this remarkable piece of music. But even more, what a wonderful climax to God's finished work. Worship of God and of the Lamb. Every creature in heaven and earth, those under the earth, as I've just said, those in the sea, every creature that inhabits the universe, worships the one who's seated on the throne. And that joint worship is remarkable in that it still maintains the difference between who is seated on the throne and the Lamb. And yet it's clear that both of them are worshipped at the same time. Like the church or the Jews, there is only one God. From day one, the church worshipped Jesus without thinking that it abandoned this principle. Early Christians affirmed categorically that there was only one God, and yet the church worshipped Father and the Son together. Worship, Worshipping Jesus wasn't something that the church would have taken lightly. There's a mystery here that we can't get away from. The definition of the doctrine of the Trinity wasn't something which took place overnight. In fact, it wasn't until after the councils of Nicaea in 325 AD, developed by the Council of Constantinople, or developed yeah, by the, Con the uh, Council of Constantinople in 380, and then finalised by the Council of Chalcedon in 451, that the Church redacted the complete statement of this doctrine. Dan Brown, in the Da Vinci Code, got it wrong. He claims that the, direction, the de declaration of Jesus being the Son of God was officially voted on during the Council of Nicaea, and that the result was very close. In actual fact, of the 222 uh, who voted, of the, or there were, of the 250 bishops who were there, 222 voted and only two voted against the motion. So instead of uh, what D Dan Brown said, that the result was very close, it was almost unanimous. In any event, here in the book of Revelation, written probably towards the end of the first century, we already have a very high understanding of who Jesus really is. The Lamb is not to be found among those who worship God. He is the object 
of the worship of everyone else. And the Amen of the cherubim comes next. It was they who started the worship in chapter 4, verse 8. It's they who put the final touches to it. They're God's closest guard, the innermost circle of worshippers. When we considered chapter 4, I asked questions concerning our worship. We discovered then that true worship focuses on the one who is seated on the throne, and that is a, it is a corporate response. Here in chapter 5, we find the same theme of worship, but rather talking about it being focused, corporate and responsive, I'd like to concentrate more on what constitutes worship. A great deal is made today in certain circles as what great worship really is. It's one of the most volatile, sensitive, political and emotional elements of being a church. Everyone has an opinion and a preference as to what worship really is. Christians fight over music, over style, liturgy versus non-liturgy, sacraments, preaching, musicians, leadership, prayers, planning or anything else as far or when it comes to worship. There's even a hit parade, would you believe, of the so-called best worship songs. But let's stop for a minute and ask ourselves what took place or what is taking place in heaven. What constitutes worship there? First of all, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before the Lamb. We have a reference in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 30. True worship. The first reaction of these representatives of God's redeemed creation bow down. As I said in the Old Testament, King Hezekiah, when restoring the temple, commanded the Levites to sing praises to God with the words of David and Asaph, and they sang praises with gladness, they bowed down and worshipped. When King Nebuchadnezzar issued the decree to fall down and worship his golden image, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to do it and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. But later, speaking through Isaiah, the Lord says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear allegiance. There are harps and incense or lyres, not only instruments of music associated with singing psalms, they also accompanied prophecy. John MacArthur comments that the elders, as representatives of the redeemed church, played their harps in praise and a symbolic indication that all the prophets had said was to be fulfilled. My only quibble with that statement would be the tense of the last statement, for what John sees is not something that will be fulfilled, it is already being fulfilled. It is taking place even now. It's not reserved for some future time. Perhaps it needs to be said that the highest purpose and expression of prayer isn't the articulation of our needs and wishes, but rather, in the highest sense, the expression of our devotion and consecration to the Lord. When we're beset with doubts, when we're struggling, when we feel that we can't cope anymore, let's remind ourselves, as John reminded these Christians towards the end of the first century, that the Lamb has conquered, and he has opened the seals, and we can sing that new song. So, what is this new song? It's new because it's unlike any other song sung before. The subject is different. The object of adoration is different. 
The original song sang the glory of the Lord God Almighty, creator of all things. Chapter 4, verses 8 and 11. But this one is new. It's a song of adoration, not to God directly, but to the Lamb, and thus through him to God. The Lamb who had been slain now holds this sealed scroll and is starting to open it. This song is new because it doesn't only speak of creation, but also of redemption. With your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe, language, people and nation. It's a song that glorifies the Lamb for his work of redemption. And that song will go around the world, echo through the universe, so that countless millions of angels, angelic creatures and the whole of creation will join, for no creature will ever be able to remain silent. Wider and wider the circles become as wave and wave join in this one great harmonious song of praise. Blessing and honour, glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And as I've already said, if that isn't enough, the cherubim add Amen and the 24 elders fall down and worship. Before I close, there's one important point that needs to be made, and that is that this God who is worshipped for his majesty in creation and his redemptive plan in these two chapters is the same God who pours out judgment. Redemption on the one hand, judgment on the other. These four living creatures around the heavenly throne are the ones who will be calling out the four horsemen in the four seal judgments. The seven trumpets are blown by seven angels who stand before God. The four living creatures, the seven angels, are to be found in the presence of he who lives for ever and ever. They are also the ones who pour out God's wrath. Not only that, there's a link between what we read concerning God's throne in chapter 4 and the later judgments when John is invited up to heaven he tells that from the throne come flashes of lightning rumbles and peals of thunder consider then with the opening of the seventh seal there come peals of thunder rumblings flashes of lightning and an earthquake chapter 8 verse 5 with the sounding of the seventh trumpet there are flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a severe hailstorm. With the outpouring of the seventh bowl of wrath, there are flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a severe earthquake. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 40 kilograms. In other words, the holiness of God described in chapters 4 and 5 is most clearly manifest in his judgment of evil in the seals, trumpets and bowls. We can never ever treat worship and holiness lightly, for it is undoubtedly linked to his just judgments. Words fail me as they did Handel when he wrote the Messiah. I've already mentioned it so I won't go back, but I ask myself the question, how professional singers can sing such words without being moved to tears. Worship is outstanding. God's kingdom is coming. Seal after seal is broken. Trumpet after trumpet will sound. Voices in heaven will declare the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign for ever and ever. And after the pouring out of the seventh bowl of wrath, we hear a loud voice crying, It is done. And in tw chapter 21, verse 3, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God. Praise be to God. Hallelujah for his wonderful salvation. 
Amen.